Hello, welcome to the National Park Service and the Federal Aviation Administration's public meeting for the draft air tour management plan for Death Valley National Park. I'm Michelle Carter, an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. I'd like to start off by defining a couple of acronyms you'll hear us use this evening. You'll uh, hear us refer to the National Park Service as the NPS, the Federal Aviation Administration as the FAA, and the Air Tour Management Plans as ATMPs. We'll define the remaining acronyms as we go along. Next slide, please. We're holding this virtual public meeting to review the draft ATMP and to seek public feedback on this draft. The meeting is held pursuant to the National Parks Air Tour Management Act of 2000, also known as NAPATMA, and its implementing regulations. You'll hear a little bit more about NAPATMA and the draft ATMP shortly, along with some information on how you can submit questions and comments. Uh, but bef before we dive into the presentations, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our speakers and to provide you with a little bit more information about meeting logistics and how you can participate. Next slide. So joining us this evening as presenters are Eric Elmore, the Senior Policy Advisor of the FAA, Vicki Ward, the Overflights Program Manager with the Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the National Park Service. And from Death Valley National Park, we have the Park Superintendent, Mike Reynolds, and the Park's Chief Ranger, Rob Wiesinger. Eric and Vicki will provide a brief overview of NAPATMA and the purpose of today's meeting. We'll then hear from Mike and Rob, who'll share a little bit more information about the park's perspective and discuss park-specific resources along with the draft ATMP. Next slide, please. Throughout the meeting, we invite you to submit your questions, which will be addressed after the presentations as part of the Q&A session. The questions submitted through this evening's or this afternoon's, depending on where you are, um, through the, the platform tonight will be considered by the agencies as they draft the ATMP but they're not actually considered formal comments. Uh, next slide, please. All official comments must be submitted through the National Park Service Planning, Environment, and Public Comment site, or PEPSI as we call it, or sent to the mailing addresses listed on the park's PEPSI site. These are gonna be considered formal comments and they will become a part of the official record. And I'll share more information about this later in the presentation. I'd like to point out too for everyone that the comments must must be received on or before August 28th of this year. Next slide, please. So this meeting is being live streamed across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And if you're watching on one of these platforms, you can submit your questions using the link to the Google form that FAA is gonna post into the, the chat area of the platform that you're using. Uh, and when the time comes, we'll read your question aloud and our presenters will respond. We're going to do our very best to answer all of the questions that we get, but in the event that we don't get to your question, we will provide contact information to where you can go post-meeting um, to, to, to direct your questions after the meeting, so stay tuned for that. Our meeting is going to be 90 minutes long, and we'll adjourn at 6 p.m. Pacific time. If we get through all of the questions early, we'll still keep the meeting active until 6, just in case additional questions come in. And please note this meeting will also be recorded. We appreciate you joining us this afternoon to learn more about Death Valley's draft ATMP. We'll now play a short video before I turn it over to Eric and Vicki to provide additional details about the Patma and why we're here today. The United States is home to some of the most breathtaking national parks and tribal lands in the world. It is important that we protect these lands while ensuring that the public has ample opportunity to enjoy these national treasures. Air tours offer the public a totally different type of experience. The Federal Aviation Administration and the National Park Service work together to manage air tours over national parks. We are developing plans that help protect wildlife, wilderness character, cultural resources, natural soundscapes, and visitor enjoyment. These plans are known as air tour management plans. And today, we will explore the specifics of the draft plan for your park. As part of our planning process, we consult with tribes, native Hawaiian organizations, state and tribal historic preservation officers, and wildlife biologists. We assess noise, wildlife protection, and other environmental considerations 
and we'll continue to make adjustments to these plans as needed. And we consider the appropriate level of National Environmental Policy Act review for these plans. The FAA and the National Park Service are committed to ensuring safe flights at our national parks while safeguarding park resources. Following today's presentation, we encourage you to review your park's draft air tour management plan and provide official comments through the National Park Service Planning, Environment and Public Comment website. Together, we can celebrate these special places and ensure they can be enjoyed for generations to come. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome everybody. Uh, as stated earlier, my name is Eric Elmore, and I'm a senior policy advisor in the uh, Federal Aviation's Office of Environment and Energy. And this evening, I'm going to provide you an overview with uh, NAPATMA, the National Parks Air Tour Management Act, and kind of the provisions that, you know, uh, provide the outlines of how we're proceeding forward in developing these air tour management plans. Uh, could you, next slide please. So the National Parks Air Tour Management Act was originally passed in 2000 and it requires the federal aviation and the National Park Service to develop air tour management plans for those parks or tribal lands where operators have applied to conduct commercial air tours. Back in 2000, the original applications uh, were made by some operators at this park, in this case, four at Death Valley, and interim operating authority was issued, uh, IOA, for those four operators. Um, NAPATMA also requires that those commercial air tours, or it applies to those commercial air tours that are flying within one half mile of the park over tribal lands within that park or abutting that park, and in the airspace that's from ground level to 5,000 feet above ground level or AGL. Next slide. Uh, now, the National Parks Air Tour Management Act does not apply. It expressly states that it does not apply to general aviation, commercial, or military flights. Additionally, Napatma does not apply to parks that are in Alaska, the Grand Canyon National Park, which is subject to its own legislation, nor does it apply to Rocky Mountain National Park. In 2012, Napatma was amended and it provided some additional provisions, one of which um, accepted parks that had fewer than 50 reported air tours in a year. Those parks are exempt from developing air tour management plans unless this exemption is withdrawn by National Park Service. In the case of Death Valley, they had fewer than 50 reported flights and so they were exempt. However, the park felt it important and withdrew that exemption and that has led us to the development of this air tour management plan. Finally, if uh, abutting tribal lands are or may be overflown, um, those tribes must be invited as cooperating agencies in our National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA process uh, in complying with that statute. Next slide, please. Now, what Air Tours does NAPATMA apply to? Specifically, it applies to those Air Tour operators that again have applied for operating authority at one of these parks in the national park system. And there are two types of air tour operators generally. They fall into two categories, those that are existing commercial air tour operators and those that are new entrant commercial air tour operators. Um, existing commercial air tour operators for our purposes are those that already have interim operating authority, our IOA, and any operator that does not have that at this point would be considered a new entrant. I think at this time, I'm gonna pass it over to Vicki. Thanks, Eric. 
Yeah, I'll continue on with the overview of the National Park Search or Management Act. I'm Vicki Ward, I'm with the Natural uh, Sounds and Night Skies Division in the Park Service. And so as we continue with the overview of the act, um, as we're developing these air trauma management plans for Death Valley and, and other parks, the objective of any ATMV is to develop acceptable and effective measures to mitigate or prevent the significant adverse impacts, if any, resulting from commercial air tour operations upon natural and cultural resources, visitor experiences, and tribal lands. Next slide. The contents of an air tour management plan are covered in the act and these plans may prohibit commercial air tour operations in whole or in part. They may also establish conditions for the conduct of the air tour operations. So an air tour management plan can, can specify the routes uh, of the flight, the altitude that the aircraft is flying at. It can also include time of day restrictions, such as a start and a stop time during the day and restrictions for particular events. If there's something, um, happening at the park, there can be a no fly day for that particular event. And then also uh, a maximum number of flights, either on a year or seasonal or a daily basis. The air tour management plan does apply to all commercial air tour operations that are within one half mile outside the boundary of the national park and meant below 5,000 feet above ground level. The air tour management plan must include incentives for the adoption of quiet aircraft technology. Those are uh, aircraft that are, are quieter than the standard helicopters or fixed wing aircraft. And the air tour management plan also provides for the allocation of the air tours when the ATMP sets a limit on the number of operations. And then for each air tour management plan, um, for the conditions that are contained within there for the routes and the altitudes and the other, other time of day uh, restrictions, number of flights. Uh, there is a justification section in each ATMP that documents the need for those measures taken uh, to protect park resources, cultural resources, and visitor experience. And those justifications are also included in the record of decision for the air tour management plan. Next slide. And this is a, for though, if anybody's on the phone, uh, this is a map of the United States that shows where the FAA and the MPS are doing uh, other air term management plans. Uh, Death Valley is obviously one of them. We are working concurrently on air term management plans for 24 parks across the US, however, uh, they are, do tend to be clustered in the Western part of the United States. So there's a couple parks in Washington that we're working on right now, obviously Death Valley and then the San Francisco area parks in California. There's a cluster in Southern Utah, um, Glacier in Montana, uh, parks in South Dakota, and then also two parks out in Hawaii where we're working on those plans. And then in the South East US Everglades and then um, New York and Great Smokies in the Eastern US. Next slide. For each air tour management plan, uh, the act requires that we publish the air tour management plan in the federal register. And we, at, we hold at least one public meeting to get uh, public input on the contents of that air term management plan. So that's why we're having this meeting today. Uh, this is a federal action, so it must comply with the National Environmental Policy Act and other legal requirements such as the National Historic Preservation Act and the Endangered Species Act. And also the uh, during this process, we invite tribes to participate as cooperating agencies for the National Environmental Policy Act compliance in cases where tribal lands are or may be overflown. And the purpose of today's meeting is to review the components of the draft air term management plan for Death Valley National Park. And I 
this point, I hand it back over to Michelle and to uh, Mike and Rob at Duff Alley. Great, thank you, Eric and Vicki. And um, yeah, I'd like to now turn it over to, to Mike to hear from the park's perspective. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks, uh, Michelle, um, Vicki, and, and Eric. And thank you especially for all of uh, the 150 of you that have um, clicked on Facebook and are still are still here, you know, 15 minutes in to this uh, government PowerPoint. So that's, I'm already impressed. So thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Reynolds. I am the superintendent here at Death Valley. I've been in that job for about six and a half years. Um, I first moved here 21 years ago. Absolutely love Death Valley um, and enjoy getting to work with uh, the public on things like this. Um, also, just a reminder for those of you that have dialed in, um, one of the purposes of this, the number one thing you, I want you to know is that we want to hear from you. Um, on this topic or, or any topic, it's very important um, in government service, in, in, in park service, to hear uh, hear hear from hear from the public. So your uh, your input is super critical. So thanks for first step is engaging with this, and then um, they'll tell you. Michelle will talk to you about how to engage with this process formally um, uh, later in this. So thank you for that. Um, just to talk a little bit about Death Valley, my favorite subject. It's an awesome place. There are some amazing special resources here. I wish we had hours. Uh, we could talk about it all or everybody were here, but uh, just a couple of the things I wanted to, to mention. Uh, one of the awesome things about getting to work at Death Valley is um, it is the traditional homeland of the Timbisha Shoshone tribe. Um, and that, uh, that was memorialized in the Homeland Act of uh, 2000. And we are really proud to be able to work closely with the, uh, the Timbisha Shoshone tribe as a partner um, as we're uh, managing the resources here in Death Valley National Park and helping uh, visitors come to enjoy the park. Uh, some of the values that we hear um, why visitors are coming and especially some that, that are increasing as perhaps their, their rarity um, goes up. Um, one of them that we hear more and more about is natural quiet. So Death Valley is a huge vast place uh, with lots of open spaces. People can come um, here and hear natural quiet. Another resource that you don't maybe think about very much are, are dark night skies. So People flock here to get um, to see some of the darkest skies in, uh, in the United States. Um, Death Valley also is 93% congressionally designated wilderness. Uh, people enjoy coming to, to experience the wilderness. Um, and uh, really, I would translate that to just massive vistas that are free from human intervention. Um, so this is a place where you can come experience that, which in 2019, pre-pandemic, pre 1.7 million visitors did exactly that. Um, more importantly, however, our visitation over the last 10 years has actually doubled. So um, it's going up exponentially. We kind of had a two years of weirdness with, the, uh, with COVID, but um, we would expect once things are back to normal, should that ever happen, um, that our visitation will continue um, increasing dramatically as a lot of parks in the, the desert Southwest have done. So that's certainly adding some new challenges, but with the visitors that are coming, um, there are new resources, like we mentioned, that they're coming to see. Um, Death Valley has a tremendous diversity of experiences that visitors can experience, uh, hiking, camping, uh, running, wildlife watching, um, learning about history, whether that's uh, mining or any, any type of history, um, lots of history here, uh, experiencing the total science, silence, natural quiet, uh, we mentioned earlier, solitude, which is common in, in wilderness, or just the mind-blowing vistas. Um, wanted to add a comment about this air tour management plan, I feel like it um, preserves a good diversity of experiences, um, which is one of the things we're always trying to balance here. Um, the process recognizes that the airspace over Death Valley National Park is, is special and deserves to be managed differently, uh, which is why we're doing a plan specifically for, um, for the airspace over Death Valley, because it's different than airspace over somewhere else. Um, and this plan serves to protect the natural quiet by limiting noisy overflights, um, but it also allows air tours to continue um, in a limited amount at, at two per year. So it allows both things to, to continue. Um, so I just wanted to remind you, it's super important to provide your input. I am now gonna turn it over to Chief Ranger Rob Wissinger, who's gonna provide you a lot more detail on some of the things you can find here in Death Valley and about the plan. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, again, my name is Rob Wissinger. I'm the Chief Ranger here at Death Valley. 
Um, and I do get to take some time to talk about one of my favorite things, which is Death Valley National Park and share with you uh, why we think it's so special uh, or why um, the Park Service wants to protect it um, and then why um, what we have that visitors come to see. So like Mike talked about, uh, Death Valley is an incredibly unique place. Uh, it's unique within the um, ecosystems that it protects and it's a un unique national park. One of the things that makes it so unique is its absolute immense size. So it is 3.4 million acres. To put that in perspective, that is larger than the state of Connecticut. Um, We're also 93% wilderness, which is about 3.2 million acres or so of, of wilderness that is congress congressionally designated wilderness. Um, some things we're somewhat famous for, one is the heat. Um, we routinely are the hottest place on the face of the planet. Um, just this year, we recorded a temperature of 130 degrees, which arguably, depends who you ask, but arguably is the hottest temperature um, reliably recorded on the face of the earth, earth and certainly within the last hundred years. Um, we also have uh, Badwater Basin, which is 282 feet below sea level. Um, and it is the lowest spot in North America. And it is adjacent to our highest point, which is Telescope Peak, uh, that sits at just over 11,000 feet. So combining those elevations, we are um, lots of different ways to look at it. We are twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. Uh, it is also with 100 feet uh, of if you were to hike from base camp um, to the top of Mount Everest. Um, that's what we encompass vertically here in Death Valley National Park. Uh, next slide, please. Let's talk about why folks come here. Um, so I talked about the size, Mike said 1.7 million visitors. That means if everybody were to come here on the same day, which never happens, um, people would have two acres to themselves. Um, that's pretty amazing in today's society, certainly um, going to the Disney World or, or Disneyland, you, you can't have that. Um, due to our extremely low relative humidity, um, we have incredible vistas. Um, the view um, is often over 30 miles or unlimited, um, and it's absolutely incredible wherever you are uh, to be able to see that far. Uh, our lack of vegetation uh, promotes that as well. Um, we have some of the best night skies. We're located in a pretty rural area. And even though um, we're low down, which typically doesn't make for great star viewing, um, our low elevation, uh, due to the low relative humidity um, and our location, some of the best night skies um, in the world uh, can be seen here. And visitors come to see them. Frequently, our, our programs in the evening, our night sky programs, uh, get three to 500 people uh, coming to enjoy those night skies. Um, Talk about wilderness, we have um, just um, under 3.2 million acres of wilderness. And it's, it's a very unique wilderness in that it's very accessible. Um, and a large majority of the visitors that come here actually are able to get out in our wilderness and enjoy that wilderness. Um, due to some of the mining history um, in the park, there's a lot of, of roads within our park. And so you can be wilderness adjacent very easily and then enter that wilderness area um, and enjoy um, the, the quiet, uh, enjoy the soundscape, um, and just enjoy a wilderness experience um, without um, some of the, um, without having to hike very far um, and things like that. And we think that's really special. Uh, we think that people enjoy coming uh, to be able to enjoy that. And we think that offers a unique experience for the visitor here. Um, like a lot of national parks, we also have some, some infrastructure. Um, so um, here in Furnace Creek, there are nearly a thousand campsites available uh, for visitors. Um, as you kind of might imagine, um, those are not uh, typically filled up in the summer. We're experiencing those, those 120, 130 degree days and, and those uh, cool nights of 100 degrees. Uh, but in the winter and the shoulder seasons, um, it's not uncommon that those campgrounds are full and that uh, we have visitors here uh, enjoying um, all of the attractions that we have. Um, some of those attractions, and there are far too many to list, so I'm gonna, gonna just hit some high points here, but uh, we have um, several sets of, of sand dunes within the park. Uh, one that's very accessible is mesquite sand dunes. And um, during the, the winter months, literally thousands of people a day enjoy those sand dunes. Um, they are very near a roadway, uh, but you actually do enter wilderness when you, um, when you go into portions of them. Um, 
thousands of people a day are going out there, um, seeing what a sand dune is like, being able to see them change um, on a daily basis and, uh, and get to enjoy those. Uh, we also have, um, due to the low elevation and the, the high levels of salt, uh, we have incredible salt formations that form. Uh, we have an area called Devil's Golf Course with uh, salt formations that are one and two feet high that people can actually go into and interact with and see um, them changing over time. Um, I talked about Badwater Basin uh, that is the lowest point in North America and visitors are actually able to walk out to the lowest point and stand it kind of moves around a little bit, but um, stand at the lowest point in North America, which is a pretty unique experience. Uh, we have areas of the park like Salt Creek that um, we do have water here. Um, Salt Creek flows, there's fish that live in there and the fish that live in there live nowhere else on earth. Uh, so it's pretty special whenever, um, if you are lucky enough to come and see them, um, you're not gonna be able to go somewhere else that, um, that has those, those particular animals there. Next slide. Park resources. So like Mike talked about, um, we enjoy a very special relationship with the Timbisha Shoshone. Um, Death Valley is the homeland of the Timbisha Shoshone who have lived here since immemorial and continue to live here. Um, we manage uh, the park with special considerations and, and with the Timbisha Shoshone, which is absolutely incredible. Um, we have literally thousands of cultural resources throughout the park, um, the, um, ranging from Native American sites um, to um, sites later um, uh, that have to do with the mining that took place here or the occupation that took place here. Um, we have an absolute plethora of plants and animals that either can't be found anywhere else on earth or aren't protected in the same way that they are here um, at the other locations that they can be found. Um, and again, some of those live and have adapted to live um, only here in Death Valley. Next slide. All right, so let's talk about our, uh, the current conditions of, of air tours here in the park. Uh, so we're um, currently, we're operating under what's um, called interim operating authority, uh, which that permits 37 flights each year, and that is um, divvied out to four separate operators. Um, from 2017 to 2019, um, two operators reported flights um, of one air tour each. Um, so the annual number of the air tours um, in the park is limited by IOA, um, but the IOA does not have any sort of parameters on routes, time of day, altitude, um, no fly periods, and there's really um, no requirement for commun communication between the National Park Service, um, being Death Valley, and the operators. Next slide. So what this draft air tour management plan proposes is essentially utilizing um, what we'd refer to as um, existing conditions um, in with two flights per year. And we did some math and if there were two flights over three years, obviously an operator wouldn't be able to fly one third of a flight um, and it didn't make sense to do one every three years. Um, so um, two flights um, and that's one um, for each operator that has flown in the last three years. Um, altitudes would be, um, Helicopters no lower than 1,000 feet and fixed wing no lower than 1,500 feet AGL. It would allow for both helicopter and fixed wing. Um, must operate two hours after sunrise and um, not operate and operate up until two hours before sunset. Um, there is room for restrictions for particular events, um, whether it be tribal events, uh, whether it be uh, park visitor visitation events, things like that. There's a semi-annual reporting requirement. Operator training uh, will be made available by the Park Service. And then there's an option for an annual meeting um, that can be triggered by either the operator or the National Park Service. And then there's also a specified in-flight communication frequency. Next slide. So this um, shows the routes uh, that the tour operators um, will be um, that we um, propose. Um, of particular note, and I know it's, it's small on most of your screens, but of particular note, um, there's a one mile buffer 
around the Timbisha village um, here that's a, the, in Furnace Creek. And that's to provide um, additional quiet um, and, uh, and respect that uh, the folks are living there and the traditional activities that, that may be going on there. Next slide. So the justification, so, so how did we get here? Um, so the annual flight limit, um, again, um, it's to um, attempt to preserve visitor experience, um, to include interpretive programs that the, that the rangers give here, um, to um, preserve tribal use, sensitive species, and then also to respect wilderness areas and the wilderness values um, that we manage Death Valley's wilderness with. Um, the um, restrictions on altitude is to uh, protect the acoustic environment and uh, to help reduce the amount of noise that, that visitors or um, the folks that live and work here would, um, would interact with the aircraft. Time of day restrictions, a couple of reasons for that one um, and, and the particular um, the um, times around sunset and sunrise are, are important for a lot of the animals. Um, obviously, with our extreme temperatures, that's when um, a lot of the animals here in the summer, anyhow, are most active. Um, so we wanted to avoid those time of day. And then also sunrise and sunset, um, as you can imagine, is a pretty special time here in Death Valley. Um, and we wanted to preserve um, the experience for visitors that are either out in the wilderness or um, at various viewpoints enjoying sunrise and sunset. Next slide. So like I said, um, uh, when we saw the, the map there, uh, commercial operators would fly at least one mile from Timbisha Village at Furnace Creek, and that's intended to protect tribal use of this area. Um, the number, as I explained, um, we came up with that number based on what we feel like the existing conditions are, and then rounding up. And then operator training and an annual meeting. Um, the, the training, we wanna make sure um, that we're available if an operator has questions or needs interpretive materials, those sort of things. We wanna offer those to an operator um, and make ourselves available for that. And then the annual meeting um, is just to make sure we're effectively implementing the ATMP. It's an opportunity um, to communicate and uh, make sure um, we're all on the same page. Next slide. And I believe I'm turning it back over to Eric. Yes, you are. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Mike. Uh, we appreciate the uh, insight to all of the uh, beautiful resources that the uh, Death Valley has to offer. Um, as uh, Vicki and I both kind of indicated previously, the development of the air tour management plan here at Death Valley is a federal action that would trigger uh, compliance with NEPA, um, NEPA being the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, the National Environmental Policy Act requires FAA and NPS to consider the environmental impacts of the what will be the final ATMP um, on the various environmental and human um, aspects of Death Valley. The, National Environmental Policy Act also requires the agencies to determine the appropriate level of environmental review. Uh, generally, there are three levels of environmental review um, to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. There are actions that fall into what is considered a categorical exclusion. Those are categories of actions that the agencies have determined um, do not have the potential to cause significant environmental impacts. Uh, the environmental assessment is another level of review that's typically prepared when the agencies believe there might be the potential for significant impacts and it's done to determine whether or not an environmental impact statement would be necessary. And finally, the environmental impact statement is kind of the third level of review. And that's typically done when the agencies know that there would probably be a significant impact or the process of the development of the categorical exclusion or the environmental assessment um, has led to the conclusion that there probably would be significant impacts that would require the development of an environmental impact statement. 
uh, for purposes of the ATMP, the Air Tarp Management Plan here at Death Valley, the agencies are currently considering uh, utilizing a categorical exclusion for this air tour management plan. Um, however, it's important to note that, you know, we are still in the process and we are going to consider the public comments that we receive on the ATMP, as well as uh, the factors and data that we get through the other processes that we'll discuss um, next. Um, next slide, please. So one of the other processes the, that we're required to undergo is under the National Historic Preservation Act. And specifically section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act requires FAA and National Park Service to consult with um, uh, other parties that would be impacted by the federal action in this space. They are in, in terminology for 106, it would be a federal undertaking. It's very similar to what's uh, required under the National Environmental Policy Act. So after we define what the undertaking is, and we would identify the participants um, in that process, we are required to determine the area of potential effects and identify historic properties that would fall within that area of potential effects. We're also required to assess what those effects would be on those historic properties from that federal undertaking. And finally, we are required to resolve adverse effects, if any, on those historic properties. Uh, so far, the FAA has, along with National Park Service, has initiated consultation with the SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Officer, the tribes, as well as other consulting parties. Uh, now I'm going to hand it back to Michelle to discuss uh, Endangered Species Act and Section 7 process. Michelle. Great. Thanks, Eric. So the FAA and the National Park Service are complying with Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, as, as they develop the draft ATMP. And this is to ensure that the proposed actions do not jeopardize the existence of any listed species under ESA or result in the destruction or adverse, excuse me, modification of designated critical habitat. And the preliminary assessment completed by both the FAA and the NPS does not anticipate any type of these impacts. Next slide, please. So as noted earlier, we are currently inviting comment from the public from the tribes, from other agencies, and from all interested parties on the draft, and, and comments must be received by August 28th. These comments can either be submitted online through the NPS public comment website that I mentioned earlier. Um, for those of you that are actually online, you'll see the link there on the slide. Um, comments can also be submitted by mail to the address also included on the screen. And if for whatever reason folks don't jot this down, that address is also included on the Pepsi, the, the planning and comment website. And for those of you on the phone, just real quick, I'm gonna give you two bits of information that you can write down. Uh, one's gonna be a web address and one's gonna be an email address. So bear with me as I, as I read this off for the, our, our friends on the phone. Um, the web address for the draft ATMP is park planning, which is all one word, parkplanning.nps.gov forward slash Death Valley ATMP. And I'll read that again in case I said it too fast. Um, it's parkplanning.nps.gov forward slash Death Valley ATMP. Um, and then you can also get more information by emailing the park's general information box. Um, that is DEVA underscore information at nps.gov. And again, that is DEVA underscore information at nps.gov. I'll, I'll be mentioning both of these later on in the presentation. So we'll make sure that you uh, are able to get the information that you need. Um, but I'd also like to mention too that on that website, the, the, the public comment website, there is a list of FAQs. Uh, it's posted right next to the draft ATMP, so we encourage everybody to check those out. 
And if uh, someone from FAA could drop the link to the Pepsi page and to the social media platforms at this time, I think it actually would be helpful too. Uh, next slide. So following the end of the public comment period, FAA and the NPS will review all of the comments that we received and they'll be used to finalize the ATMP. They'll continue to coordinate and complete the tribal, the 106 and the section seven consultations uh, and the NEPA process will be concluded by signing of a decision document. Once all of this is wrapped up, the ATMP will be considered complete and it will be available on both the FAA and the NPS websites. FAA then will operate their operations specifications for each of the air tour operators. Next slide. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of our presenters. We'll now turn over to the Q&A portion of the meeting. For those of you that may have joined during the presentations, I'm Michelle Carter. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the National Park Service and I'm moderating the meeting this evening. So if you have a question you'd like to submit, please post it using the Google form using the link shared by FAA and the chat area of whatever social media platform you're using, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And for those of you on the phone, um, you'll be able to direct questions after the meeting to that email address I mentioned earlier, the DEVA underscore information at nps.gov. Uh, as a reminder, any questions that are submitted through the meeting today will be considered by the agencies as they continue drafting the ATMPs, but they're, they're not considered the formal comments. The formal comments must be submitted through the Pepsi page or the planning environment and public comment page that we, meant, uh, we mentioned earlier or sent to the mailing addresses listed on the Pepsi site. Again, both of those are displayed here. Um, and I guess it doesn't hurt to mention too, just in case for those of you on the phone, again, that website is parkplanning.nps.gov forward slash Death Valley ATMP. So thanks for bearing with me as I repeat all of this. Uh, the formal comments that you guys submit will become part of the official record. Uh, and as a, a further reminder too, we just wanna make sure that all comments are submitted by August 28th. So I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the meeting, it's gonna be a 90 minute meeting and we'll adjourn at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And in the event that questions are all answered before that time, we're gonna to continue to hold the meeting until 6 p.m. just in case additional questions come in as people have time to think about the presentations and to, to ponder what they've heard. Uh, so we'll go through a couple of questions I see that we've had come in here. Um, then we'll go off camera for a little bit, keep the meeting live and, and pop back on just occasionally to check with folks to see where you are. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to move over here to the questions. Um, it looks like the first question we have here, we'll, we'll send it to Vicki, the NPS. Um, so is this public meeting a requirement for an EIS or an EA? And can you please explain how NEPA is being done? Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, yes, the, this public meeting is a requirement under the National Parks Air Tour Management Act. And so we're, uh, as mentioned earlier, we're intending to develop the air tour management plan under an NPS categorical exclusion, which is 3.3A1. And that's from the National Park Service National Environmental Policy Act handbook. Uh, this is a categorical exclusion that is defined as allowing changes or amendments to an approved action when such changes will cause no or only minimal environmental impact. Uh, because the proposed action is very similar to the existing air tour operations and includes new operating parameters, impacts resulting from the effects of the proposed action would result in no or only minimal environmental impacts. In addition, the inclusion of new operating parameters, including altitude restrictions, time of day restrictions and quiet aircraft technology incentives would ensure that the park would experience only beneficial impacts to the environment compared to current conditions. Uh, FAA and NPS 
We'll consider public comments on the air to management plan, information obtained during consultations, and fully assess the environmental impacts before making the final determination on what NEPA pathway is appropriate. And under this um, categorical exclusion, you know, we mentioned what the, you know, the amendment or a change to approve action, and that is uh, defined as the interim operating authority that was was issued by FAA, which was uh, pursuant to uh, the National Parks Air Trail Management Act that directed FAA to grant the interim operating authority. Great, thanks for that response, Vicki. Okay, um, looks like we've received a, a few similar questions here. Uh, Eric, we'll put this over to you. Uh, there's a couple of parts to it, so I'll read it slow. First part is, what is an air tour? The second is, does the plan apply to all planes over national parks? And the third part is, can general manned air aircraft fly over national parks? So if you need me to repeat any of that, let me know. Thank you, Michelle. I'm gonna try my best to remember all three parts here. I believe the, the first one was what is an air tour? Now, there in general, I can do it in layman's terms and kind of kind of uh, more specific. So, so to start with the specific, I think that the uh, what a commercial air tour is is defined in the uh, Federal Aviation Regulations under 14 Code Federal Regulations, Section 136.33. Uh, if anybody needs a site to actually look for it. But in essence, what the definition says is that a commercial air tour is any flight conducted for compensation or hire in a powered aircraft for sightseeing over a national park unit within a half mile outside the boundary of a unit of the national park system or over tribal lands during which the aircraft flies at or below a minimum altitude of 5,000 feet above ground level, except for takeoff or landing, or as necessary for the safe operation of aircraft under the FAA regulations, or less than one mile laterally from any geographic feature within the park, unless more than outside that half mile boundary of the so that was a long, complicated answer that we tried to summarize in general. It's for uh, somebody who's offering a, an air tour for, for compensation, kind of within the uh, airspace above a national park, um, up to 5,000 feet above ground level is kind of what, you know, constitutes an air tour. Um, the, the second part was it, uh, does the plan apply to all planes over national parks? And the answer to that would be no. So because of the specifics of, of, the, of the National Parks Air Tour Management Act in, in regards to applying only to commercial air tours, um, NAPATMA does not apply to general aviation um, commercial aviation or military flight. So it would not apply to the air tour management plan at Death Valley would not apply to those other types of operations, only to commercial air tours. Um, and then I think the last part was whether manned aircraft can fly over national parks, Michelle. And I think the answer to that is, uh, as I just said, um, yes. Uh, because uh, it only applies to commercial. I mean, everything can fly over the national park. If you're a commercial air tour, you will have to you know, comply with the air tour management plan that once it's finalized at Death Valley. So hopefully that answered, hopefully I answered all of the questions, Michelle. So thank you. Yeah, that, that was great. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, you know, I, I wanna reiterate what, um, Superintendent Reynolds said earlier, like, we really do want to hear from you. Um, this is a chance to, to throw all kinds of questions out there at us. We're, we're here for you. So uh, please use the Google form to submit your questions. Again, that link is in the 
the, the chat feature of whatever social media platform you're using, um, just send the questions our way. Um, we have one coming in right now. It hasn't come through all the way. So I'm gonna go off camera and on mute just for a couple of minutes while we have time to see what this question is. And we'll be back here in a second uh, to share it with you. Okay, and here it is. So the question is, and Eric, this, this is for you. Um, why do you only allow two tours per year when the operators are currently allowed to fly many more, almost 40 annually? Thank you, Michelle. Um, that is actually, that's a very good question. And, and thank you for that question. Um, so we're trying to, 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 to do a data-driven process. And as part of that process, some of the data that we do have available is seven years of reporting data. Um, and that data shows that there were two tours that were conducted um, within, I think, the last three, the, for the three-year average of 2017 through 2019. We specifically did not include the COVID year, um, just in case that had any impact. And so um, the data showed us that this is what's going on and that there, uh, I guess this is kind of showing what the demand is. And so in order to balance the park resource protection along with uh, to provide access to the uh, park uh, through other means, through air tours, um, we came up with two air tours for the air tour management plan at Death Valley. And also, I think the, another aspect is that the air tour management plan kind of gives more structure to what's happening at Death Valley. As was indicated earlier, IOA really only um, kind of addresses the number of operations. And this management plan allows more structure in regards to routes, altitudes, uh, restrictions, time of day, et cetera. So, that's kind of how we came up with the two air tours and hopefully that answers your questions. Thank you for that. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, so right now it's a, it's a little quiet on the question front. Um, we're gonna, again, keep the meeting open. Um, it's your opportunity to submit any kinds of questions. So, so please, please submit them as they come to you and uh, go off. Well, I'm gonna go off a video for a little bit and mute, but uh, we'll be monitoring the chat to see how we can answer questions. So thank you.
Okay. Um, another question just came in, uh, and Vicki, uh, we'll point this towards you. Uh, the question is, does the ATMP limit the military flights that come over the park? Sure, Michelle, I'll answer that, and I might need some uh, assistance from Mike and, and Rob, just because they'll, they'll know a little bit more about the specific uh, military operations training that happens over Death Valley. Uh, there are training areas uh, for military uh, overflights over Death Valley. Um, however, this air term management plan does not address those military overflights. Um, so during this process, though, we, we do look at the existing noise from military overflights or other activities because those are considered part of the existing condition of the soundscape at a park. And for this air tour management plan, the number of air tours proposed in this air tour management plan are so few that when considering the cumulative impact of those air tours plus military flights, the impacts of the air tour management plan are not significant. Okay, great. Did anybody have anything more to add? I don't, yeah, I don't know if uh, Rob or Mike had anything else they wanted to add about the, the military. Yeah, sure. This is Rob. Certainly, um, park has a rich history uh, of, of military flights. Uh, a section of the park is beneath the uh, R2508 um, training um, area, uh, which is a training area designated by the United States Navy uh, for training flights. Um, we have uh, an excellent relationship with the, the military and work with them constantly on, on issues of of overflights and, and, and timing, and, and we actually have some parameters set up um, uh, for minimum altitudes with them. So um, yes, we certainly um, have, have overflights. Um, that is a, a part of our history. It's actually in our enabling le legislation from 1994, um, and, uh, and will continue to be a, a, a part of our history. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, and here's a question for Eric. Uh, when will the ATMP be final? Thank you. So, this agencies currently are, you know, in the process of, uh, you know, consulting with uh, one under 106 and, and also, you know, conducting this public meeting tonight. And so we're basically, uh, the process will, we're going to continue with those consultations, um, also consulting with the tribal governments as necessary. Um, eventually, we'll come up with a final air tour management plan um, after we've considered all of the comments and all and what data and information we get through the other processes. Um, at that point, both agencies will approve the final ATMP. Uh, and then at that point, the operation specifications for the uh, air tour, the two air tour operators or whatever it is in the end um, would be modified and the ATMP would become effective within 90 days of publication of the final ATMP. So we don't really have a hard date. It's just kind of how the processes play out. Um, but the public will be notified when the air tour management plan is does go final. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, so that's that's it with the current list of questions. As I said earlier, continue to hold the meeting for a little bit longer. I'll go off camera and off microphone, but uh, please continue to submit your questions and we hope to hear from you.
wow, I can't believe 110 people have come to a government PowerPoint and we only had like four questions. So um, we must not have used too many um, confusing terms or acronyms uh, or just nobody has any questions, but hopefully uh, now's your chance to ask questions. You've got everybody's attention for 29 more minutes. So please um, want to hear, want to hear from you. If you had anything that's ever bothered you, or you've had a question about, about ATMPs in Death Valley, it's a great opportunity. Okay, another question came in. Uh, can other can other operators start flying over the park? And this will be a question for Vicky. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks, Michelle, for that question. So they actually, I'm gonna answer. I think a two part answer here because right now they're, you know, as we mentioned, they're four operators with interim operating authority. And even though um, there's that interim operating authority, a new entrant would still have to apply even prior uh, to the development of the air tour management plan in order to be granted interim operating authority. Uh, there haven't been any new entrants uh, applying for air tours at, at Death Valley uh, since the original IOA was granted. Uh, so under the, once an air tour management plan is established, there will be a provision in that air tour management plan that new entrants, if somebody wanted to conduct air tours, they would have to apply to the FAA and NPS. And so that would be someone who hasn't been granted any other operations under the air tour management plan. Um, so there will be a process for reviewing those applications that FAA and NPS will, will publish additional information about the, the form and what the content of that new entrant application is. Um, and then we'll jointly review the applications. Uh, they are subject to approval. Uh, they have to be, they would be reviewed within the context of the management objectives of the air term management plan for the park. And then if there was a grant of that operating authority, uh, the there would either have to be an amendment to the air tour management plan um, and go through another a national environmental policy act process. And if that, if all those things did happen, then there would be uh, an amendment to that operator's operating specifications to allow them to do those air tours. Uh, and the process right now that we're uh, going to put into place would be probably about every Within six months, um, if there was re any applications received prior to the effective date of the air to management plan, we would look at those applications within six months. And then anything after 
the establishment air tour management plan, we would consider uh, no less frequently than every three years from the effective date of the air tour management plan. Great, right, great. Thanks, Vicki. Um, we now have a question here for Eric. Um, can the plan at the park be changed? Can the plan at the park be changed? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, an ATMP may be amended at any time, um, but, but an amendment would basically start a process. So uh, if anybody requested an amendment, the FAA and the NPS would jointly consider that request from whatever interested party had submitted it. Um, right now we know in, as regard to that process that any request would have to be made in writing and submitted to both the FAA and the NPS. The request to amend the air tour management plan must include a justification as to how the requested amendment is consistent with the objectives of the air tour management plan with respect to protecting the park resources. Uh, also, you know, how does it protect or impact the tribal lands, uh, visitor use and enjoyment, and, and why the proposed amendment would not adversely affect aviation safety or the national airspace system, the NAS. Um, the FAA will publish some additional information for any interested parties about the form and manner for submitting a request for an amendment. Um, finally, I'd like to ask that uh, notice of amendments to an ATMP would be published in the Federal Register and uh, public comments would be accepted in if such a situation did arise. So hopefully I answered your question and thank you for that. All right, great, thanks, Eric. Um, we have one more question that just came in here now. Um, this question is for the park. I think we'll give it to Mike. There you are on the screen. Um, any of the flights be landing at the Furnace Creek landing strip? And the answer to that is no. Um, so the two uh, potential um, overflights per year that are just for air tours, um, air tours are not permitted to land in the park. So they couldn't land at Furnace Creek or Stove Pipe. Um, they would have to take off from outside of the park, uh, fly around and look at things, and then land outside of the park. So um, they would not. However, that, that's a great question, whoever asked that, because um, there is a, unlike uh, most parks, um, there is a ton. Of, we have three uh, active airstrips in the park. Uh, one of them is at Stovepipe Wells, one of them is at Furnace Creek, and one's far away in the backcountry, Saline Valley. The Furnace Creek and Stovepipe Wells airstrip, particularly Furnace Creek, sees, um, sees uh, regular flights every day uh, in the fall, winter, and springtime. Um, just, they're not commercial flights, they're not air tours, they're not military, um, they're just private planes. People who have a private planes fly to Furnace Creek, they land. And this plan has nothing to do with, or does not control or say anything to private planes utilizing the airport. Air tours themselves um, would never land at the airport. I hope that answers the question. If anybody needs um, any follow-up to that, feel free to, to drop it in the chat. Um, say right now, it doesn't look like we have any new questions. So as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll still give it a little bit more time in case folks are, are still thinking about what they heard in the presentations. Um, I'll go off camera and off mic, but we'll be here still for a couple of minutes. If you think of a question uh, you'd like to share. And uh, So I apologize for my pause here. I like, was reading a few things as they were coming in. Um, and it looks like that there's a, uh, a question about the, actually the, uh, the airstrip at Furnace Creek. Um, 
is the airstrip at Furnace Creek structurally adequate to operate air tours in Death Valley? And, and what we just heard a minute ago is that um, there's no air tours to that airstrip. But Mike, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to add related to that or any additional clarification? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, air tours can't land at the air, at Ferns Creek Runway. Um, so, but it's a great question. I'll just assume that the actual question was, what's the condition of the Furnish Creek Runway? The answer is terrible. Um, it needs about $5 million worth of work to make it safe to land on. It is still open to the public and people use it. But if you were a private pilot, um, and maybe there's some on the phone um, or streaming, um, you'll, when you get close to the airport, you'll see um, that it um, has a warning about this condition of the surface, uh, which is uh, deteriorated over time due to a thing um, called salt heaves, which is somewhat unique to desert. Um, however, uh, it is open and it just has a warning that the conditions are, are poor. And for some types of planes that like backcountry airstrips, um, it's a great one for you know, challenging themselves. And for people that want uh, nice, smooth runways, um, you know, it's, it's a terrible place for that. So that, um, but yeah, it doesn't affect air tours. Thanks, thanks for that clarification, Mike. Um, so I don't see any questions right now. As I said before, I know I sound like a broken record here. Um, We'll, we'll stay on the line for a little bit longer. If you think of anything else, please share it. And um, in the meantime, uh, I'll go off camera, but we'll be monitoring the chat.
So it looks like we have a couple more questions coming in. I just wanted to let folks know, uh, just stay tuned. We'll, we'll be back here in a couple of minutes after, um, after we are, have a chance to get, get through these questions. So we'll be back in just a second. Thank you. Okay, um, did have another question come in and uh, Eric will give this one to you. The question is, um, how is the FAA considering the tribe's concerns? All right, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for that question. Um, so the, the tribal's concerns, we're, we're, we're still, um, in the middle of the 106 consultation process. And, and that process um, allows us to, to get information and input from the tribes. Um, as part of that process, I think the agencies um, reached out to over, I think 100 plus tribal uh, uh, letters were sent seeking um, participation. I think there were 23 in particular at Death Valley. Um, if I got that wrong, somebody else, uh, can chime in. Um, and so as part of that process, as well as the other processes under uh, Section 7 and, um, and NEPA, you know, we'll get that information in particular from the tribe or the 106 and see if there are any um, adverse impacts to any tribal uh, cultural resources as part of the process. And if, if that is determined, then we'll, um, you know, again, continue the process and seek, seek to, you know, find ways to mitigate or avoid um, those adverse impacts. Um, but it's still an ongoing process and that feedback and that information we get from that process will um, be considered um, before anything is finalized and, and will be taken into consideration um, as part of our process. So hopefully that answers the question as to how we're, um, including um, or addressing, trying to address tribal concerns as part of this ATMP process. So thank you. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, and it does look like a couple more questions may be coming in. So if we'll just stay tuned here for another minute, we'll make sure that we are able to get to these questions.
Hey, Michelle and others, uh, just wanted to add something else. I just wanted to reiterate, I guess, or emphasize, you know, um, uh, the superintendent Reynolds, um, you know, he and um, uh, Rob have kind of articulated that they had a very good relationship with the Timbisha Shoshone tribe and um, kind of emphasizing what they said earlier that, you know, we want to encourage the tribal members to review the air tour management plan and to please submit any comments and concerns that they have. Uh, I think, you know, I think Michelle will once again properly provide uh, some information of where uh, uh, comments can be submitted. So I just wanted to, you know, emphasize again um, the good relationship and that we are seeking their input. So thanks, Michelle. Great, thanks for that clarification, Eric. Um, and on my end, it looks like there might be another question or two coming in. So we'll give it another couple of minutes and um, we get the question to come through. We'll be sure to pop back on here in just a moment. So thank you all for your patience with us.
Okay, um, we actually have one more question here. Um, when um, when will the FAA meet with the Tembisha Shoshone Council? Eric, do you want to take that? Sure, thanks, Michelle. Um, so I don't believe we have yet uh, set a date for a meeting with the Timbisha Tribal Council, but obviously we hope to set something up soon. Um, and I'll make sure I reach out to I double check with the people leading our 106 process. But I do know that we, um, we had a call recently, I believe last week with the tribe, um, the park, as well as the FAA on and we did discuss um, some of the issues and concerns that the tribe had in regards to the air tour management plan, but we certainly hope to set up a, a date as soon as possible with that. So thank you very much um, for that. And we definitely will be following up. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, all right, so... Looks like we've actually come to the end of our meeting time. Um, and I'd like to turn it over really quick to, to Mike for some closing remarks. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I just wanna thank everybody for joining us um, and sticking with us all the way through 90 minutes. Um, some excellent questions uh, and uh, want to remind you how important, I know I said this at the beginning, how important it is that we hear from you, um, either formally on this, this uh, plan or on anything. Um, one of the things that's super important to us at Death Valley National Park is to hear input um, from you. So uh, you can certainly put comments on this, but um, on any any other aviation related topics, uh, please send in your, your emails or um, or stop by. So thanks again for coming tonight and sticking with this um, and look forward to hearing from you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, and then just to wrap us up here, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I wanted to reiterate that there's a FAQ document that's posted with the draft ATMP on the public comment website. Um, and so be sure to check that out. And if FAA um, could drop the Pepsi link in right now. That might be helpful. Um, and then if you had a question that was not answered during the presentation, uh, as Mike said, you, you can still reach out. Obviously, he's very open to having communication uh, with our interested tribes and, and public and other agencies. So, so please don't hesitate to reach out. And you can also use the email address that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Park General Information at DEVA underscore information at nps.gov. Um, and if FAA has that link handy too to drop it in the chat, that might be helpful. And just a final reminder that questions that were submitted during the meeting today will be considered by the agencies as they finish drafting the ATMP, but, but they're not the formal comments. We, we want all of the formal comments to be submitted through that public comment website or sent to the park directly via email. Um, and a final reminder that comments should be submitted by August 28th of 2021. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Uh, on behalf of both the FAA and the National Park Service, we really do look forward to hearing from you. And we hope you have a good rest of your evening. Take care. Bye.